Good morning and welcome to the first focus on seminar from our Cancer Center for 2022. We have a spectacular uh, plan for today's seminar on cancer signaling with um, two amazing speakers, Sylvia Goodkin and Matt Angauer from uh, UCSD. Um, I'll introduce Silvio, um, and uh, we'll have uh, Swasti from our faculty um, moderate the discussion later on. I can spend the next 25 minutes describing each of the 52 page CV for Silvio Goodkin. I will not do that, um, just to indicate that Silvio got his PhD in pharmacy and biochemistry in Buenos Aires moved to NIH, um, led the signaling group in the beginning, and then was chief of number of uh, groups within um, NIH. Moved over to uh, UCSD in 2015, um, professor of the department of pharmacology, uh, assistant director, uh, associate director for the basic science in the cancer center. And um, currently he is leading the pharma chair of the pharmacology department, UCSD, um, member of the National Academy of Medicine and um, uh, currently also distinguished professor at UCSD. Uh, Silvio is going to uh, tell us today about the work he has done in recent years in head and neck cancer and how his work um, um, guides precision medicine as um, we understand it today. So without any further ado, Silvio, all yours, please. So thank you, Seb, for the introduction. So it's wonderful to be here, I would be much better to be in person, uh, but for certain it's wonderful that uh, we can communicate with everybody now and, and also that this could be recorded and available. So um, I, give me one second, screen two, perfect. Let me share this. And you see it well? Perfect. perfect. So thank you again, Zeb. Um, and what I really look forward is to um, enhance our interactions and looking forward for future collaborations. We already interact and collaborating with many, many um, um, scientists in Sanford Burnham. It's a wonderful opportunity to, to even expand that. So our lab is a signaling lab. So we really focus on how proteins form networks and how they form pathways and how they control cell proliferation and how they are important in cancer. So from that perspective, we it, our lab it works in two uh, topics, primarily uh, G proteins and G protein couple receptors. I was uh, in in Sanford Burnham um, previous uh, giving a talk a couple of years ago, mostly focusing on UV melanoma and G alpha Q and the HIPPO pathway. I, in, we're also working on GNAS and PKA uh, in many cancers, especially colon and pancreatic cancer, and more recently GPCRs in immune oncology. This particular aspect I will not be working on, I will not be presenting today. I will focus 100%, especially with Matt uh, presenting uh, his amazing work on melanoma. I will really focus primarily in head and cancer. And the primary pathway I will focus on is the Pietri Kinas AKTM TOR. I will be talking about the two clinical trials um, in the development of new syngenetic animal models to study immune oncology. And then finishing again from the signaling perspective, how we can uh, take advantage of this new information to develop co-targeting uh, therapies um, using um, anti-PD-1 um, checkpoint inhibitors combined with the use of inhibitors of the of signaling pathways. So these are my disclaimers. Um, I will not, I believe, will not be affecting my presentations, and I will also uh, describe uh, two clinical trials. So let me start by defining head and neck cancer. Um, it's the sixth most common cancer in the developed world, roughly 600 uh, new, new cases um, every year, resulting in 300,000 deaths. In the US, roughly 15,000 deaths every year. For practical purposes, there are usually two types of uh, head and neck cancer, and mostly in the oral cavity. There will be beetle in area canal in Southeast Asia, for example, um, in India. In tobacco, chewing, smoking, and usually when combined with alcohol will be most, um, most countries, especially um, in the United States. So tobacco related, if you will. And then uh, roughly 25% of, of the 
oral uh, of the oral cancers are due to HPV, mostly HPV 16. They are usually in the, in the back of the mouth, so we call oropharynx. The survival rate of this cancer have not changed uh, dramatically over, over, with, even with all of the new developments uh, for the last 30 years. So still a lot of work to be done to improve the survival in, uh, of these patients and the quality of life of these patients. Something very special from oral cancer usually doesn't happen from one day to another. Especially in the oral cavity, quite often these are the initial, the, the cancer is preceded by the presence of uh, lesions, usually um, white lesions in the tongue. It can be hyperplasia or dysplasia. Specifically, dysplasia are at high risk of conversion to cancer. And that's really unique because it provides an opportunity to really monitor this process and also um, use the information um, about the genetics and the um, molecular rents, as we'll see in a second for early detection, understand this process at the molecular level, and for stratifying which patient will progress faster. And, and for our perspective, quite important, the opportunity to intercept this process, we will call precision prevention and treatment. And certainly uh, some of these lesions are visible, so they, 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 it's, it's possible to do serial biopsies, which is quite um, not feasible in many other cancer types. For practical purposes, we know, we know many mutations that happen in, in head and neck cancer, and I will not be spending a lot of time on that. So again, from a signaling perspective, even if there are many, many different mutations, each patient will have a different set of mutations. Usually we, we focus, um, so for the signaling perspective, there will be just a handful of pathways that are usually deregulated. The one I will be describing today, focus on the Pietricanis at the tour, very important, and we contributed a couple of years ago, uh, the most demonstrated the second most mutated um, a gene in, in head and cancer is FAT1, and, and this is uh, controls the HIPPO pathway. There's also regulation of the notch pathway, concomitant with deregulation of uh, mechanisms involving stemness, proliferation, set cycle, particularly uh, for E6, E7, for example, uh, proteins, and uh, P53 as well. So again, for practical purposes, I will focus primarily on platicane, psychitim, and uh, mTOR pathway, and usually can be due to a, a, a few years ago, and we'll show in a second, we showed the mTOR at the most downstream component of this pathway is activated roughly 90% of all head and neck cancers. And this can be due to um, amplification in EGFR, mutations in pietricanes that are relatively often, around 15 to 20% are enriched in, in, in the HPV cancers, few mutations in, in grass and few mutations or deletions of P10. So again, a few years ago, um, we showed that mTOR is activated in most ketonic cancers. And in particular, this will be our signaling for today. And, um, well, and it's relatively easy to detect that the most, one of the most downstream targets is phosphorus 6 And using very simple immunohistochemistry, you can see that even in dysplasia, you already see activation of mTOR. Uh, you say certainly activation in, in, in cancer. If you, we uh, collected tissues from all over the world and we show the phosphorus 6 this will be unsupervised class comparison, a, a, a stratification, and then you will see the phosphorus 6 is activating red. The majority of the cases of so the normals are all clustered together and correlating with the KT, which is upstream, uh, but not specifically not with the HFR, phosphorus HFR, which is the activated the phosphorylated active form suggesting that even if EGFR plays a role, I was expected uh, initially to play a very central role, at the end EGFR, probably at the time of diagnosis, there are already mutations or alterations downstream from EGFR that may render EGFR um, inhibitors not, um, not successful for the treatment of that cancer. I will mention this a little bit uh, soon. And using, uh, it's very interesting because for, for uh, there are many inhibitors of mTOR, this, shall I say, the, the most studies is uh, rapamycin. It's exquisite in terms of its selectivity to block mTOR um, in, indirectly when binding to a protein called FKBP12. And that's very nice because in many uh, tumor xenograph models, we showed it was very, very active. Even we have tested many other drugs, it was one of the most active for tumor xenograph. And we see very nicely decrease in phosphorus 6. Of course, we run all of the Western laws to confirm this is also correct. Uh, but it's very nice that we can see very quickly, just one, two days after um, use of rapamycin, we can see phosphorus 6 decrease. So we spent quite some time uh, being at, a, at NIH developing animal models for oral cancer. <clears throat> 
that they did not exist before. And essentially using genetic models, different combination of RAS, P10, TG beta, P3 kinases. Uh, also xenograft models for HPV, uh, and more recently here at UCSD, developed a genetic model for HPV. And the one that I like the most is a chemically induced carcinogenesis model. You expose the mice to a carcinogen called foreign QO, the mice will leak and will develop primarily cancers in the oral, in the oral cavity, mostly in the tongue. In every single model we tested, rapamycin was quite, quite effective in other inducing the collapse of the tumors, pre-existing tumor, or preventing the, the, the further progression of the tumors. So I will not be showing the data, but the key is that activation femtor is a very early event in this process, in all of these models, and what we think is a necessary event. And uh, for enhance that can be a vulnerability that we can use for treatment. If you put all together, besides this basic science, which you can see also we using rapamycin, we can cure mice. Of course, the key issue can we help patients? And the answer, it was a bit uh, took some time to develop a clinical trial, in this case using rapamycin. Um, and so patients, this is called a window of opportunity trial. Very patients were screened, treated with rapamycin for um, three weeks and surgical resection at the end. So one week wash off. Uh, so surgical um, uh, biopsy after the 24 hours after the last administration of uh, rapamycin and then a sur surgical resection one week afterwards. The result of this clinical trial uh, was quite remarkable. We saw roughly 25% of the patients, they have a positive, what they call resist positive responses or more than 30% tumor reduction. That included one complete response, which happened to be HPV, but, but we, we cannot say whether HPV is more or less sensitive. So by the time being, I can only say it was quite, quite active. Um, there is a, already presented in collaboration with Shirian Nathan and, and, and Ezra Cohen, uh, the, the, it was presented in NASCO. So there is, we, we conducted a, a clinical trial in high-risk patients after a head and cancer patients after surgery, uh, to use mTOR inhibitors to prevent tumor uh, recurrence in these high risk patients, uh, achieving very, very nice responses. Happy to uh, share during the, the discussions. So, there is certainly a room for mTOR inhibitors in head and cancer. The one area that is very exciting, I mentioned to you, EGFR inhibitors usually don't work in head and cancer. Cetuximab was approved for head and cancer. And yet, most of the cases, there is a limited response, and quite often they are not durable. In that context, a few years ago, we showed that if you can co-target a mTOR inhibition, in this case, rapamycin or, or everolimus, combined with the cetuximab, enhances dramatically the response. And also, we, we showed that uh, um, addressing the, if, what I was mentioning to you, um, the potential for alteration downstream from EGFR, if we do knockouts of uh, using CRISPR of some of the components of the pathway, render cetuximab ineffective in models that do respond to cetuximab. Mm -hmm. And something I want to comment, especially being here in San Diego, in collaboration, so we focus on the HRAS, this small subset of HRAS, mutant patients in collaboration with Cura Pharmaceuticals. Uh, we, we show that these are very sensitive to one particular inhibitor called TP in, in the clinical trial that was recently reported supports this very, very targeted uh, approach for this particular uh, HRAS positive patients. So let me, so, okay. Now going a little bit early, if you want, um, I mentioned to you that um, mTOR uh, is activated very early and this is unpublished, please do not post, um, although I have shared this before. So we saw in a, in a clinical trial uh, called the um, um, EPOC trial, I conducted um, at MD Anderson, and Scott Liebman, myself are involved in, were involved in the trial, Scott as the PI. And so we showed that uh, there's activation of uh, mTOR very early in oral pre-malignancies. In the presence of this a particular activation usually precedes, or at least you can say the correlates very nicely with the progression to cancer. One every five, one every four, one every seven lesions will evolve into cancer. If you have an alteration of a six or mTOR in the basal layer, it's more likely to progress into cancer. With that in mind, we, we did a screen for different drugs that can be repurposed to block and, and tour, and, and they are safely to use for prevention. So prevention is quite important. Safety is central. Um, of course, we could have used rapamycin, but, but there are concerns about the prolonged use of rapamycin. 
And so we use, we use metformin in, in, in using the screen. The winner was metformin. It's very exciting because metformin is used for more than 1 million patients in the US daily. It blocks, I will not get into, into the pathway right now, blocks them told indirectly by blocking mitochondria complex one, that leads to activation of AMPK, so reduction of ATP, AMPK activation, and that blocks them told indirectly. So the key issue is that we, we uh, adapted, so basically we check those, we have pharmacologists, in which you achieve the same level of, of, of metformin in the drinking water, same levels that, that you achieve in, uh, in patients, um, for diabetic patients, so they can be safely used, decrease proliferation in this oral pre-malignancy, so this is for in few animal models, decrease some total activity, activated AMPK, uh, requires a transporter, so it really works on the, on, on the cells themselves. If without this transporter, it's called CT3, that doesn't work. The most important, reduce the multiplicity of the tumor lesions. Basically, reduce the number of tumors, but at the same time, the number is quite carcinoma. With that in mind, we put together a clinical trial. It was a recently completed and, and reported, um, and that involved um, patients, the um, subjects, they have oral pre-malignancies. They were treated for uh, three months with, with metformin, metformin regular doses, as I was describing, um, like biopsies before, biopsies after. The response is a single arm uh, treatment. And so the, the response was quite, quite uh, exciting. So we saw roughly 60% of the patients, we see a histological response to the metformin. So uh, that involves roughly 17% of complete responses. So it became from hyperplasia, or mo so sorry, mostly dysplasia became normal. Um, and partial responses, it means downgrading the histological um, severity of the lesion, which usually correlates with a progression to, to cancer. That was really, really exciting. Mm -hmm. I just mentioned, so the lesion's size did decrease. Um, some cases they were progressing probably may have been already cancer to begin with. We, we don't, we certainly we do, do not know. But the most, in, uh, absolutely, we did not expect the patient to have the best responses where the, the smoking the patient there were current or former smokers, which are usually those that are most likely to, to progress into cancer. The basis for this is not, we don't uh, fully understand yet. So we are currently exploring. We think it's because the potential effect of metformin on the immune microenvironment in addition to blocking the tumor. So for practical purposes, we see very correlation with decreasing um, proliferation, K67, decreasing mTOR activity, and very nice correlation between mTOR, um, um, decreased mTOR activity in histological and clinical responses. So the, the, the summary of this part is we can use mTOR inhibitors for oral cancer treatment, and also we can indirectly block mTOR uh, using metformin uh, for um, prevention of oral cancer. In the corresponding a clinical trial, a extended clinical trial, um, the double blind placebo control, uh, two arms, uh, is, is has been recently approved by NCI. We expect to start uh, the trial. It will involve 10 centers all over the US and, and two centers in Canada. Uh, we expect to start probably in May or June this year. Fingers crossed. So that's excellent. So, however, of course, this is this is all uh, mostly focusing on targeting therapies, and we all know that there is we we, we live in, and you will see from that as well what we call the cancer immunology revolution. So the idea is that you can target the immune system to respond and to kill, so to react and to recognize and to kill the cancer cells by using, in this case, immune checkpoint inhibitors. That is also true for hidden cancer. This is in melanoma, there are responses using PEMRO and NIVO, or PEMRO either as a second line and then approved as, 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 a, as a first line in recurring metastatic hidden cancers. But however, roughly 20% of the patients respond. So you can see here one of the, the trials that led to the approval of the, of the use of um, checkpoint inhibitors, in, in this case, in the, in the first line, recurrent metastatic disease, a remarkable response, uh, better than, than any other treatment. However, a, a roughly 70% of the patients uh, will, will, will succumb to disease in, in around uh, two years. So it's a lot of work to be done yet, okay? It's not done, uh, it's not mission accomplished. So the idea is, is, is the possibility that everybody's exploring the potential for combination therapies uh, to increase the response to immune checkpoint inhibitors. 
However, there are many, many combinations being tested in many cancer types. Quite often, um, don't, um, the expectations are higher than the, the increased responses in many of the treatments. So with that in mind, what we thought is that one possibility, maybe because the animal models that were used to identify these treatment options may not be perfectly mimicking the human getting a cancer. So with that in mind, so we, we started going back to this foreign Q animal model that I described to you, developing syngeneic animal models that hopefully would reflect better the cancer. And so we collected cells from these lesions, very difficult to culture them, to expand them, and to obtain some. They would go on tumors, but we have several. We have a panel of them. You inject into the tongue, and they form tumors in the tongue. They are uh, epithelial tumors. You can even do cold movies. And so what is very, very interesting is that um, these lesions are in very heavily immune infiltrated. They are not cold. Similar to humans, most, most hitting cancers, they, they, they are uh, uh, most, not all, of course. So they're very hot, but, but, they, um, but, but the cancer evolves means that the T cells don't work. Um, and, and essentially most of the T cells are, are exhausted. So have a T cell exhaustion markers. Something that been here at UCSD and, and next to Ludmil Alexandrov who defined the hum, human um, 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 immune uh, mutanome. So the signatures for each one of mutagenic, um, um, mutagenic events. Uh, it was very exciting. So when he analyzed our animal models, we, we found that they reflect 93.9% similarity. They have similarity to human tobacco-induced cancers. That is really exciting because it's, to the best of our knowledge, this is very, very unique. That you can really reflect the cancer that you really want to make. Now, the a very exciting issue, these mice respond, 10% 10, 10 of the mice will respond to uh, checkpoint inhibitors, which is very, very similar to humans, 10 to 20% will be responding. Something I, I, I will mention also that they respond, these mice respond, so you, you can use this model for identifying new thera therapeutic options. And the, these mice, uh, they respond very well to anti-CTL4, extremely well, almost 80, 90% will respond to anti-CTL4. And you see increase in CD8 being recruited. You can see here, for example, control in anti-CTL4. However, anti-CTL4 is not being used uh, quite often due, in, in, due to its um, potential side effects. So it has enhanced um, immune-related adverse events than, than um, anti-PD-1. So with that in mind, collaborating with uh, Joe Wang in engineering, we develop a system for the delivery of anti-CTL4 locally into the, into the cancer. So using um, micro needles, and you can see here, so the very exciting, the response I will not show here, but it's almost identical. This is in press. Um, it was released yesterday. So the, the response is similar to, to the using systemic, but the beauty is that you don't see, um, a, a, almost you don't see any immune related AEs. So here is uh, using with FOXP3 um, TTR mice, we remove the, the T-Rex, and then in these mice, anti-CTL4, induces a huge number of, um, of um, uh, lesions, so particularly in, in the eyelid, skin, et cetera, uh, mimicking those that can see in humans. And in, in, in the local delivery, this doesn't happen. So how can we go back to MTOR? Well, now it's a little bit uh, unexpected, if you will. Certainly we, can, we could use low dose of rapamycin, then have limited effects on the immune system. But we went back to ask a very, very simple question. So what controls the mTOR activity in heterogeneous cancers that do not have piatricania CKT mTOR activation, don't have mutations? And using um, cells that don't have mutations, we did a, we conduct a siren screen and look for, um, it's a kind of white siren screen, and we look for those that decrease the proliferation. And then among those that decrease proliferation, we counter screen for those that reduce M mTOR. Why Western blots? You can go to the paper, it was recently published. Um, really a lot of um, Western blots, more than we ever have ever done. And so, and the winner from this was HER3. So HER3 is not a prerequisite, it's exciting, it's not expressed in immune cells, at uh, least CD4, CD8s, but expressed into the cancer cells. This is from a patient, this is from um, cells and then cancer cells. And HER3 is relatively unique. I'm just showing, so this Lauren in our lab using single cell sequencing data sets, you can really see it's only expressing the epithelial cells, non 
in any of the immune cells, this is from head and cancer data sets. It's really unique because it's not, an, it's not a kinase. So it's, a, it's called pseudokinase itself is not active as it would not phosphorylate. But uh, in a lag independent uh, new regulin and regulin will bind EGFR or HER2 or can be independent. And by this light, by these receptors or many other receptors will lead to phosphorylation of HER3. And HER3 acts as a docking protein has six phos phospho tyrosine motif that when phosphorylated will recruit pietric kinase. And quite often it's implicating resistant to many, many drugs, mostly are uh, receptor tyrosine kinase inhibitors, BRAF making pietric kinase inhibitors and overexpression phosphorylated in many, many different cancer types. So I would just show one Western blot. This is not the one that went to the paper. If you remove HER3, you see very nice phosphor 6 going down. If you express catrican in cells, so no effect on ARC. If you express catrican in these cells, they don't respond. If you have catrican in wild type uh, cells, they don't, they don't respond um, to the reduction. And um, the idea is that EGFR will primarily control in this cancer, will control the RAS ARC pathway with the Catherine's pathway and mTOR seem to be controlled by HER3. So we can use a very specific antibody. You can see very nicely here in this question blows, reduce phosphor 6, reduce AKT, reduce phosphor 6. Uh, so her, her phosphor HER3 does not affect ARC, and that reduces the uh, tumor burden. And in parallel, and that's almost my final slide, Holocaust, my final slide. So in the parallel, we did uh, a study uh, with Evan Krogan and Trey Eidaker looking into all of the molecules that are involved in hidden cancer and, and try to look for those that protein-protein um, interaction network analysis. And one of the most exciting that was a particularly that uh, most of the pietrikinias, even some of the mutants, they can associate very, very tightly with HER3. So I would say the large fraction of the pietrikinias in hidden cancer is associated with HER3. Mm -hmm. And um, going into the uh, probably final slide, so the, the uh, way, if you block with HER3, we see very, very nicely the tumors will regress, the majority, but it can progress on treatment or off treatment. If you combine, you have 70% of the mice will be uh, complete responses. And the, you see very, very um, exciting, we see immune modulation, so very rapid reduction in the MDSCs and reduction in M2 macrophages in English T cell infiltration. And that is concomitant with the very, very dramatic changes in many cytokines and chemokines that we believe, is, believe are, are important. So the bottom line is the cotarin in HER3 and PD-1 represent a novel combination therapy. In HER3, pietric and SMTOR are the intersection of growth and signal and immune evasion. So either reducing growth, cancer cell death, but also reducing the, the uh, release of what we call immune, um, immune suppressive cancer associated um, it's a, a secretome in combination with immune checkpoint will be effective. I would just mention that hitting cancer summary, widespread activation of pethicanes, AKTM TOR, cancer initiated cells are addicted to pethicanes, MTOR, MTOR activation can happen downstream from HER3 in many of the cases, in roughly 70% of the cases, in other cases by mutational and pethicanes, P10 and, and HRAS in the development of new animal models reflecting the ketene cancer mutant. The possibility is to use precision therapies for treat ketene cancer, either blocking directly in TOR or HER3 or indirectly through metformin for prevention and the possibility of um, using combination therapies affecting the immune, one, the growth of these cells, but at the same time, the immune suppressive um, a release of cytokines. Um, and I will stop there in the key issues. So these are our collaborations uh, all over um, um, so this is our team in all over UCSD, you know, look, look for and these are our funding agencies. We're very lucky coming from NIH. Uh, having to write grants was a challenge, but it worked. And uh, certainly looking forward to many collaborations with anyone in the audience and especially in SP, in South for Vernon Previs. Wow, thank you so much, Dr. Gokhan. That was a, an, an amazing talk. I actually feel like I'm in a world because there were so many topics that you have covered. <laughs> Uh, while we wait for questions to come up for the Q&A, I have a couple, um, maybe Zeb has a couple as well, but I'm really interested in this idea that you have this HPV-driven, tobacco-driven, needle nut driven um, And, you know, it looks like from your mTOR studies, the mTOR inhibitors work only in a subset of patients. So do we know whether mTOR is specifically implicated in one of the different 
sources or no? No, so it works both. Happened that the complete response is only three, so keep in mind, it's three weeks treatment of very advanced patients. So the, the fact that the HPV, we have the complete response in that particular case is just one patient. So you, we cannot, based on all of our um, accumulated data works in both. So that said for the, the study on a prevention of a tumor recurrence seem to be working primarily the other way around, or at least our data supports the tobacco related, maybe more sensitive, but that is because those have high recurrence. And hence you can see the, the lower recurrence rate, but I would say they work in both HPV positive and HPV negative um, kidney cancers. Is there a difference in just genomic instability or tumor mutation burden or something between the, so I'm thinking about how in lung cancer, for example, the smokers versus non-smokers have a very different mutational profile. And I'm wondering if that is contributing to either less dependence on mTOR or um, increased sensitivity to immune uh, blockade. So, so it's a good point. So the, the idea, initial idea or, or prediction, if you will, was that the tobacco related cancers, uh, so, sorry, the HPV positive will have because the, the uh, AE67 viral oncogenes will be more, uh, we have enhanced response to checkpoint inhibitors. That turned out not to, not to be the case. So we did not, so the, there is, uh, so the patients with HPV positive negative, they have very similar responses. The other side is also true the tobacco um, associated kidney cancer have higher mutational burden. That it may, that may be why um, there's no difference. One will have more mutational burden. The other one will have a, a viral a oncogenes that make it susceptible right. to immune checkpoints. That said, for the metformin, within the metformin, that may be what helps in metformin um, the activity because we, we think that presence of higher um, mutational burden through a secondary effect on, on immune modulation, if you will, from metformin, it was really excited about that. Maybe even if the tobacco is so that, that maybe we think again it's working hypothesis that maybe the rationale of why the metformin will have enhanced response in tobacco users. That said, for our next clinical trial, uh, will be mostly in former and current uh, tobacco users. So that will be part of the inclusion criteria. Uh, but certainly, would not everybody response will be monitoring. So they, it would be very heavy with the uh, advantage of working with Ludmil very heavy into the, into the analysis of mutational landscape. So in immune infiltration as well. Did you have a question, Zev? And then I'll go back yeah. to the Q&A. So a quick one, uh, Silvio, very nice talk. Do you know if um, uh, metformin affect the immune system, the TME? Oh, that, that, that's precisely what we're doing right now. So the, the answer is yes, the answer is yes. So it has already described, but it's a little bit difficult to see what is primary or secondary event. Two things that I will refer to is that, well, um, at the end, you see more CD8s, and, and at the end, also, you see um, um, some of the response to metformin. In, in our new animal models are dependent on, um, it can be reduced if you block CD8s. Uh, but, but to be very practical, we are doing right now, so we think the primary effect may be not initiated by CD8 T cells, but seem to be similar to the show for HER3, seem to be more mediated by, initiated, not mediated, by uh, changes in M2 macrophages. So that we see the most dramatic changes are in macrophages. Whether this is, is the cause or consequence, this is what we are studying right now. Um, and we have a, a, a mouse model in which we express a, a gene called NDI1 that we use in some of our prior studies. Uh, that um, makes the cells insensitive to metformin because it's uh, uh, the mitochondria complex one involves 43 uh, proteins. You can rescue, if you put this uh, yeast protein called NDI1, um, you restore the function of mito uh, mitochondria complex one, even in the presence of metformin. We have used in, in our uh, cells before in our uh, studies, which you can, you can find them. But now we have an animal in which is a no kin, a conditional no kin. So we, we can, in a Cell specific fashion, we can restore India one. Um, Mike, if you're in the audience, you, you will be showing that soon. So it's really cool. And we, we, we can see which is cause consequent more than um, describing uh, changes in, in, in the immune, uh, immune modulation. I'm going to address one of the questions that came up in QA, and then I will let Dr. Hango go ahead, and then I'll come back 
to a few questions that are still outstanding in the discussion session at the end. Uh, but this is sort of related to what you were discussing earlier, which is, and, and I know this is probably gonna be a lot of speculation, but what do you think are the parameters defining why a subset of patients respond to rapamycin or mTOR inhibitors, but some of them don't? So I, I will not say, so I will, I will, I will, um, um, so, I was a part of the trial, so I'm deeply involved in the in the trial design and in the analysis. And so, to some extent, keep in mind the, the fact that in three weeks, this is called window of opportunity trial. The fact that in three weeks you have 25% receive positive responses is just very compelling. I will not go beyond that. It was very very compelling. I will not say that the other ones did not respond. Is at the time uh, at the, it's because the timing. If you may have kept longer. I will assume that many, many more may have responded. This was, so I will not take this resistant in, um, at this stage. So in that component, um, that said, so this one of our studies is precisely doing the genetic analysis using CRISPR screens and others to identify mechanism of resistance. I can tell you for in advance, the major mechanism of resistance, we, we, we reported that using um, sgRNA library screens, is, is the reactivation of ERK. So we, we think they act in, we may monitor in our patients, although we didn't have a p-value, but the ability to block mTOR can be compensated in some patients by the activation of ERK, but it's very difficult to block both at the same time. So I will, I will say that that at least is one of the mechanisms of resistance. We, we think that may be the rationale for why without, that was after that, okay, but so um, that may enable us to reinterpret why we see the cetuximab uh, in, in, in um, um, rapamycin uh, synergies yeah. because one may be blocking ERK reactivation when you block uh, mTOR. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Uh, one quick question before I let you go, but um, so this is an interesting question in the Q&A, which is in a way sort of trying to figure out why metformin, metformin works as a preventative so well, is have you, have you tried to see whether other ETC inhibitors or anything else that, um, you know, inhibits mitochondrial function, would it work just as well? Is that the main mechanism? The answer is yes, but it will not be feasible. Will not be, so in cells, in, in the answer is yes, and yes, and yes. And, and the, the issue that I mentioned with NDI1 that we can rescue, uh, when we express this NDI1, to some extent provide high confidence, the primary target is the mitochondrial complex one. This doesn't mean that there are many other targets. Mm -hmm. The other one, if we, if we, we reported, if you the, um, knock down this transport called OC3, so met, met, metformin can go everywhere into the mouse in this case, uh, but we not get into the cancer cells. So if you block OC3, um, that's not accumulating into the cancer cells, then we don't see responses. It suggests that it may have, have many, many functions in general metabolism, IGF-1, um, uh, in our patients, we don't see decrease. We are not using in, in diabetic patients, so there are almost no changes in the glucose or IGF-1. Um, I can tell you all the things that did not happen in, in our patient population, and yet it works. And, and uh, certainly we don't know about the microbiome. We haven't done it. That will be included in our next uh, placebo control trial. That will be much better. But that said, we, we think that one of the key events is to work on the, on the primary cells. The precise mechanism I cannot tell you, but the reality is that you can use many other drugs, but this form is the only one that's relatively safe. And I, I didn't mention, so part of the rationale in a, a epidemiological study is retrospective, all well taken. In, in Taiwan, initially with 30,000 patients, then with another 270, altogether 300,000 patients. Again, retrospective, diabetic patients, on metformin, they have roughly 50% less uh, head and cancers. So basically, the, the, the um, epidemiological rationale is very, very strong as well. Yeah, that's really interesting. Um, I'm going to let you go for now, but then I will probably make you answer more questions at the end. Thank you. Thank you, Svasti. Um, we're going to move. Thank you, Silvio. We're going to move from uh, head and neck to melanoma. Uh, we are staying with uh, UCSD, uh, and I am pleased to introduce Matt uh, Hangwell. And, Matt came from um, a Berkeley where he got his PhD and did postdoc with uh, Frank McCormick and Michael uh, McManus. He was working on non-coding RNA in cancer. And in recent years, moving to UCSD, establishing his lab here, he started to work on a, one of the uh, unmet needs in cancer, persistent cells. Uh, 
and we're going to hear about um, his work in persistent cells in melanoma. Matt, all yours. All right, thank you very much. Um, let me make sure my sharing is going okay. My screen visible okay? Uh, go to full screen. Okay, take this out. We lost you. Coming back. Perfect. All right, great. All right, well, thank you very much for the opportunity to speak today. And, you know, since this is a focus on cancer signaling, I picked the project for my lab that has the most signaling in it. And um, this is actually, you know, the first time I've pre presented this work and I'm very excited about it. So I'd be very interested in your feedback on this. Um, so this is a very generic title, doesn't really describe the project because I decided sort of in the, in the uh, meantime. Um, so first disclosures, um, I uh, consult for two companies and founded one, but neither are the topic of today. <clears throat> so my lab is generally interested in this process of acquired uh, resistance to therapy. And uh, in the context of melanoma, this, would, uh, this is a famous uh, study from 2011 where a patient with metastatic BRAF V600E mutant melanoma is treated with bemurafenib, B, a BRAF inhibitor, patient responds, and then they relapse. And so I'm very interested in this process. Can we understand the sort of molecular details of the process? And are there, is it gene driven and is it therapeutically targetable or preventable? Um, so in cartoon format, uh, we, uh, refer to the sort of residual cells. They're known as minimal residual disease. We also refer to them as persister cells. Um, and they sort of uh, form a reservoir from which uh, resistant tumors can emerge. And we didn't coin the term persister cells. This was coined by Jeff Settlement's lab, who was then at Mass General and now is at Pfizer here. Um, they initially are focused on EGFR mutant lung cancer. And they, using an EGFR inhibitor or lotnib, they found that if you treat uh, cells in a dish with high dose of drug above the sort of um, lethal killing at least 90% of the cells, you end up with these sort of residual quiescent cells that sort of stick to the plate. And my slides are weird here, but um, these cells that were found to have a sort of global uh, transcriptional silencing uh, reflecting chromatin marks. Um, they have non-genetic resistance early on at this sort of early time point of about 10 days to two weeks. Um, and it, it's reversible. So we know it's non-genetic because if you pull the drug off, the cells regrow. And if you add drug, they die back down. And I'll show that in a moment. And it's also not clone specific. So it's not based on pre-existing, at least genetic clones that are different from others. And there's um, interesting data that I'll show in a moment that they may pre-exist in the parental cell population prior to treatment. So there's also been some uh, recent studies about persister cells that have been uh, quite uh, illuminating. So this, this is a study from, uh, from the Marine Lab in Belgium that showed that using a melanoma PDX model, when you treat um, preformed tumors with BRAF and MEK inhibitor, tumors shrink, then there's this minimal, minimal residual disease period, and then tumors relapse. They did single cell RNA-seq on each stage, uh, stage one, two, three, and they found that in phase two, the minimal residual disease stage, there's an enrichment for this blue dot, which are stem-like cells, which fits prior literature that these residual sort of persister cells have cancer stem cell, uh, at least markers. And also looking at signaling, uh, just phospho-ERK and also the melanoma differentiation transcription factor during treatment and in the minimal residual disease state, phospho-ERK is inhibited, but then it reactivates as the cells emerge or the tumors re regrow. Um, and then getting back to where did persister cells come from, um, the reference isn't showing up here, here we go. So Arjun Raj's lab from UPenn showed that um, in uh, melanoma cells that are just growing in a dish without any drug, that there's actually very noisy gene expression and they termed it gene expression jackpotting. And if a particular cell happens to transiently overexpress a gene that confers resistance to drug, and then the cell is uh, treated with drug, it will survive drug initially over here. And here's an example, Axel receptor tyrosine kinase that's uh, known to drive resistance to a number of targeted therapies actually. But you can see here, zooming in, there's a cell that has jackpotted Axel next to a negative cell. And so this is about a hundred fold increase in, in expression. Um, and basically what happens initially is that there's a transient resistance, 
uh, through this jackpotting. And then epigenetic resilience, epigenetic reprogramming occurs during treatment to create a more resistant colony. So that's potentially at least partially where the origin of these cells come from. And so, you know, our lab is, we use melanoma as our primary model, but we also study uh, lung cancer and breast cancer cells. But here's a melanoma model, um, BRAF E600E mutant melanoma that we treat with targeted therapy, BRAF a MEK inhibitor, we get persister cells. If we pull the drug off, they regrow, a drug holiday. And if we add drug again, they die again. So at about two weeks, the, the drug resistance is reversible and non-genetic fitting with prior literature. However, if we continue to treat with drug for another month to two months longer, eventually a small proportion of these persister cells, usually five to 10%, will regrow into colonies. And these colonies are irreversibly drug resistant. So the assumption here, and there's literature I'll show in a moment, is that at some point during treatment, mutations arise that confer resistance or at least a irreversible epigenetic mechanism or relatively stable mechanism of resistance um, emerges. And regarding, um, and I should also mention just um, as far as um, what I'm gonna call these cells, we refer to these as DTAPs, so drug tolerant expanded persister cells. These are the colonies that have grown out during constant treatment. So um, another lab at um, UCSF, Steve Altschuler and Lonnie Wu, their joint lab, they did this very interesting exper experiment that really was, um, got me excited about the project I'm going to talk to you about today. So they started their um, experiment with a single cell, not shown here. This is lung cancer, EGFR mutant lung cancer. So now they've you know, eliminated pre-existing heter genetic heterogeneity by starting with a single cell. Then they grow up just enough cells in one dish to be able to do their experiment. Then they treat with their lotnib, so an EGFR inhibitor, kill off 95% of the cells. Now there's single persister cells on the dish after about two weeks. Then they continue extended treatment, and now they have these colonies, DTAP colonies. They call them PERCs, but the settlement lab called them DTAPs. But these are the resistant colonies that are regrowing, and only a subset of persister cells actually regrow, 5 to 10%. Then they separately picked these individual colonies and separate them and grew them up separately in drug for another 5 to 7 months. And then they whole exome sequenced all of these colonies separately, so it's about 20 and what they found was very interesting. So remember, they started the experiment with a single cell, and they found that a variety of resistance mutations were present that were private to each of these colonies. And that, that's pretty strong evidence that mutations, and in fact, resistance mutations arise during treatment within the persister cell uh, and or early expanding colonies. And this a similar result was found specifically focused on the EGFR T790M gatekeeper mutation in lung cancer by uh, Jeff Engelman's lab in same year, 2016. So this was really uh, exciting for me because I thought this is a really un unopened, unknown question. How do these mutations arise? Are they stochastic? Can anything be done about it? And in the last two years, there's been some really exciting developments in this field. So I'm not showing just in the interest of time any of the older papers, but uh, the phenomenon of stress-induced mutagenesis has been known in bacteria, particularly, and fun fungi somewhat uh, for about 10 years. And the, the idea here is that bacteria can sense stress, such as antibiotic treatment. They enter a quiescent state. They activate uh, error-prone DNA repair or error-prone DNA polymerase. Um, and it's mediated by this uh, sigma factor that's a transcription factor that's induced by stress. So the idea is that bacteria sense stress enter a quiescent dormant state to survive the stress and then increase the, the rate of mutagenesis and allowing sort of each bacterial cell to become a lottery ticket to find genetic resistance to whatever the stress insult is and then escape. So it was hypothesis. It was maybe hypothesized that this could happen in cancer, but there was no evidence until very recently. So there were um, two papers in science, one in 2019 and one in 2020. Each showed essentially the same thing. Um, the idea here is that stress uh, is drug-induced stress, and this is non-genotoxic drugs, so not chemotherapies. These would be targeted therapies that um, do not directly interact with DNA. Um, they adjust the expression of DNA repair machinery across multiple sort of repair mechanisms, and it's broadly downregulated, and then certain error-prone DNA polymerases are upregulated. That was the first study, just observe the phenomenon. And the second study was showing that at least in some cases, mTOR 
uh, can control the expression of these uh, genes. So these are some repair genes in different cell lines treated with an mTOR inhibitor, and that causes downregulation. But the big question here was, okay, so drug, can, drug stress can induce mutagenesis, and it does it, and it also induces DNA damage. Um, and this DNA damage is presumably repaired in an error-prone manner due to downregulation of repair enzymes. However, the huge mystery is, how does drug stress induce DNA damage in the first place? Where does this DNA damage come from when you're using drugs that don't directly interact with DNA? And in fact, this has been recognized as a major uh, problem and also a potential uh, opportunity. So this was a review from uh, two years ago now that showed that you know, drug resistance is a huge problem in cancer drug development. But in particular, there was a question about what are the upstream actors and potential drug targets that detect therapeutic stress and a drive adaptive mutation? So it's recognized that this is an open question. It's potentially actionable with a new therapeutic approach if we identify that there's a gene-driven process for a cell to recognize drug stress and cause mutagenesis. So this is where we became very interested in this. Um, and so we thought, let's go searching in persister cells and see if we can find um, a mechanism. So the first thing we did was just single cell RNA-seq on here on mel melanoma persister cells versus parental cells. They're different. Um, they're, this is just the, the, the persister cells have an EMT signature or a mixed signature. These are things that have been previously seen. Persister cells are broadly uh, arrested in G1, um, which like 95% of the cells are non-cycling arrested in G1. That, the reason I show this is it makes it a little unlikely that DNA replication is a primary source of mutagenesis within a population that's almost entirely quiescent in G1. Um, doesn't rule it out. So then we also did gene set, set enrichment analysis of persister versus parental cells. And we, I'm not showing here, but we also did it with lung cancer persister parental cells, single cell RNA-seq. And we took the intersection of genes that are upregulated in persister cells specifically. And these are the top signatures. So number one is EMT, which has been seen before. It's dr a drug-induced signature. Number two is UV response down, which and it's an enriched, which means that DNA repair machinery is down-regulated, just like the two science papers showed. And we see it as well, looking at the same genes that those labs showed. But number three was an apoptosis signature, which we thought was peculiar. And indeed, if we look at um, the gene set, we see it's enriched within persister cells and melanoma, and also in lung cancer, the persister cells are over here. We see this apoptosis signature is enriched. So that kind of was something we thought was interesting because there was another set of literature I was aware of. And this is happening about the time I started at UCSD, which was the fall of 2018. And there's a set of literature that uh, is fairly recent that uh, when uh, executioner caspases, such as caspase three and seven are activated, it's not necessarily lethal for tumor cells or for normal cells, that cells can recover depending on the level of activation and the timing. And so I got interested in whether or not is there actually apoptotic signaling going on within live persister cells that survive? And so the first thing we checked is whether or not there is mitochondrial outer membrane permeabilization, one of the hallmarks of apoptosis. And indeed, we do see this selectively in persister cells, an, an increase in cells that exhibit this MOMP uh, signal, but at a sublethal level. These are rigorously live cell gated cells with a live dead stain. They regrow eventually if we pull drug off. So then we went and looked at cleave caspase three, which is a you know, core hallmark of apoptosis. And we see that indeed there's a cleave caspase three signal within persister cells that are alive. And in fact, it's not just melanoma, it's in lung cancer and two different uh, drug treatments for EGFR lung cancer and also uh, HER2 breast cancer. So that led us to the hypothesis of, okay, so if persister cells have activated sublethal apoptotic signaling, could that be a mechanism by which cells sense stress and transmit it to become to induce DNA damage. So the overall hypothesis here is that during a drug treatment, initially persister cells form through a reversible non-genetic mechanism, but through further prolonged treatment, active mutagenesis within persister cells allows for the emergence of uh, resistance mutations and uh, irreversible resistance and over the month's time scale. And then within a persister cell, the signaling that's going on is drug stress induces caspase three activation. Now this is where the, the major step came in. Um, during apoptosis, one of the final steps is that cells uh, fragment chrom their chromosomal DNA into small laddered pieces. And the, there's the key enzyme that mediates this process 
is called DFFB, the blue or purple ball here, DNA fragmentation factor B, also called CAD, CAD, caspase activated DNAs. And so activated, and uh, DFFB is normally held in, by a chaperone protein, DFFA, that allows it to fold properly off the ribosome, but then also holds it in an inhibited state uh, until DFFA is cleaved by caspase three, and then DFFB is allowed to di homodimerize and induces uh, double-stranded and single-strand DNA breaks in a non-sequence specific manner within open chromatin is what we're aware of. And we hypothesized that in concert with the previous observation that we also see in our persister cells that there's a drug-induced downregulation of DNA repair ma machinery, that this could be the source of DNA damage that's been missing and that that could ulti ultimately increase mutagenesis, allow for drug resistance and mutations. So we're extremely excited to find uh, this bit of data here. So the hypothesis is completely centered on the idea that there's caspase-mediated DNA damage, which had not been observed before. So we used a caspase inhibitor, QVD, which is a pan-caspase inhibitor. We first derived persister cells, and you can see here that persister cells have DNA damage, gamma H2AX. And then once persister cells are derived after 12 or 14 days of drug treatment, we add this caspase inhibitor, wait three days, and then assay DNA damage, and we see that it ablates the signal. And we see it again, not just uh, melanoma, but also lung cancer, persister cells um, have their DNA damage blocked by a caspase inhibitor here with either erlotinib or azimertinib, a third generation EGFR inhibitor, as well as HER2 breast cancer cells treated with HER2 inhibitor lapatinib. Also, uh, caspase inhibitor blocks DNA damage. So we are extremely excited about this because that means that we just observed something novel and that this could potentially be the missing source of DNA damage in the mechanism. So next part of the mechanism is that if this is actually happening, that caspase three would cleave DFFA um, and you can detect cleave DFFA fragments on a Western and indeed we do see cleave DFFA in persister cells. So uh, this does appear to be happening and that's the most direct readout for, D for DFFB activation is cleavage of the inhibitor. There's not a direct assay currently for DFFB activity. So next to look, instead of just correlation to do functional experiments, we had to CRISPR delete DFFB. So just doing some homework briefly in melanoma along the breast, we see that DFFB is constitutively expressed in the parental or persister cells. It's not really upregulated in persister cells, it's just there. So then we CRISPR deleted it. We made multiple knockout clones in each of the lines. Um, and then using the CRISPR clones, we then tested whether or not DFFB is required for the DNA damage signal. And indeed, we find that it is. So if we regular wild type persister cells have DNA damage, if we knock out DFFB, parentals don't have DNA damage anyway, but the knockout persister cells should, except they don't, which means that it's dependent on DFFB. And again, we see it in lung and breast cancer persister cells. So it's not just a melanoma phenomenon. And then just doing a little more homework here, we see that uh, if we knock out DFFB, um, DFFB knockout cells, and we uh, re-express a wild type nuclease active DFFB above a certain level with a dox inducible expression, we can restore DNA damage within, oops, within DFFB knockout persister cells. But if we attempt to re-express a nuclease dead variant of DFFB, we're unable to rescue DNA damage. This is evidence that DFFB nuclease activity is essential for the DNA damage that we observe in persister cells. So the next obvious question is, keeping my time here, is um, does DFFB induce mutagenesis? Uh, so we did this very painstaking experiment uh, where we start with a single cell to eliminate pre-existing uh, genetic heterogeneity. Then we do the minimal expansion that we need to get enough cells for an experiment in a dish freeze off a reference sample. So that's sort of what does the baseline genome look like in these cells? And this is with melanoma cells. Then we treat with drug for two months uh, during which cells pass through a persister state. And then the wild type cells emerge into these DTEP colonies, which I'm gonna show you this data in a second. But the knockout cells actually just sit as persister cells. They don't regrow, which I'm spoiling the next slide, but I have to tell you that here. Then we single cell uh, bottleneck a number of cells from these drug treatments at the end of the uh, treatment time and whole exome sequence separately these single cell bottleneck populations and count the number of mutations that are distinct from the reference. And we find that the wild type cells have significantly more mutations than the knockout cells. There are still mutations in the knockout cells. And so that's of interest to the future. We think certainly some of this, at least 
the sequencing noise. If you see if there's a, a base call is incorrect in the reference, uh, that would result in uh, an a acquired mutation called. And we could tell that if it's shared between a, multiple different colonies at the end, if the mutation is shared between them, it could probably pre-exist it. So we primarily focus on mutations that are distinct between the colonies. But in any case, there's a definite uh, DFFB dependent rate of mutagenesis during this drug treatment. So going back to the mechanism, um, we, we now have bits of data supporting all of this. Uh, the big question is, does this matter at all for drug resistance, which is our ultimate goal? So again, going back to our model, so here's the melanoma cells again. Treat them for two weeks, we get persister cells, and you can see just sort of single cells sticking on the dish. Keep treating for another five weeks, and you still have a bunch of little single cells, but you get, you get certain colonies. And for us, we, we said if a colony is larger than 25 cells, that we would consider that to be a DTEP colony. And these are generally you know, outgrowing, proliferating. So the majority of the cells remain single persisters. There are some colonies. So we asked, do, does, is DFF be required for colony formation? Um, and indeed it is. So here's in melanoma cells, we see our two different CRISPR knockouts. We get a far lower rate of DTEP. So this DTEP fraction is the percent or fraction of cells on the dish which have become a colony that's countable over 25, divided by total number of cells, including all the single cells. And so we see that in lung cancer, we get almost no colonies growing out. In breast cancer, we also get very few across multiple clones. And so then the important question is whether this matters in vivo. So using the melanoma model in vivo. So we'd previously established that if we treat with dibrafidum trametinib around this time scale, we can have wild type tumors shrink and then relapse. Um, and we see that the knockout tumors don't relapse. This experiment is a nude mouse or NSG mouse with a wild type tumor on one flank and a knockout tumor on the other flank. <clears throat> so we're very excited about this data. We also just, uh, interest of time, I might go quickly through this. So we just found that DFFB is not essential for tumor cells. So when we knock it out with clones, they generally proliferate somewhat similarly. Here's a little bit slower in the A375, but not a big difference. If we look at all the CRISPR screen data that's been done before where DFFB has been included in the library, we see that DFFB is not essential for any of these cell lines across many tumor types. Uh, anything below zero is not essential. And then we also see that it's not essential for initial drug response or for persister formation. So there's definitely clone to clone variation, including with wild type clones, but you'll see that here, like one DFFB knockout clone actually responds less well to treatment um, this one responds more to treatment. When we look at a more two week time point, there's also up and down. This one, these are both down. But in the most cases, we don't think that DFFB is playing a role in drug response or tumor cell viability. We think its phenotype is more specific to acquired resistance. Um, this is kind of an important point, though, the idea about drug, drug response, because DFFB's canonical role is in apoptosis. Um, there are a couple, there are multiple studies saying that DFFB is not required for apoptotic death and cells die, they just don't fragment their chromosomal DNA. But nonetheless, it's important to check this because if DFFB was important for promoting apoptosis, we wouldn't want to block it in, in cancer treatment. So last point is, um, second last slide, is that uh, <clears throat> we also have um, another, multiple other projects in the lab. One of the projects is looking at melanoma, or sorry, immunotherapy and whether or not there are persister cells that survive CD8 T cell attack. And indeed, we, we found that there are. So it's a model where we co-culture melanoma cells that, that endogenously present an antigen, ESO1, together with uh, primary human CD8 T cells with a retrovirally inserted TCR specific for that antigen. We have another cell line and a couple other antigens. But what we show is that after repeated uh, T cell uh, co-culture for two weeks, we replace the T cells every three days to avoid uh, exhaustion. We get residual persister cells that look just like the chemical or the targeted drug persisters. They regrow. If we pull T cells off, they die back down again. So they're reversible. And if we keep them on T cells, replenishing the T cells every three days, we eventually get these colonies growing out that look just like the DTEPs. And so just, I'm not going to go into detail on this project. It's, this is still going, but um, we do see that these residual we're, we're calling them immunotherapy persister cells, also exhibit cleave cast base three, and this is by flow down here. They have MOMP, um, and here they have decreased numbers of intact mitochondria, which is the inverse of what I showed before. It means more MOMP. Um, and in, most importantly, if we um, inhibit caspase 
in these immunotherapy persister cells, we block gamma H2AX. And if we delete DFFB, we also block gamma H2AX. So the next question we haven't gotten to yet is whether or not this DNA damage that's induced by CDAT cell attack that fails to kill the target cell results in DFFB mutagenesis and also whether it affects uh, response to immunotherapy. So that's it. Uh, last point I'll say is that DFFB expression as well as DFFA, its chaperone and inhibitor are inversely correlated with overall and disease-free expression. So we think it might be an interesting drug target even independent of our findings. And that's it. And I just briefly mentioned August Williams is the PhD student that led this project and the others that are bolded here uh, contributed. So thank you and I take any questions. Thank you so much. That was really an excellent talk. Um, and very, very interesting what this is. Uh, there's one question in the Q&A that's already come up that I think is really, really germane to what you've been talking about, which is, what is a mechanism that restricts the activation of caspase 3 so that there's not enough activity to induce apoptosis, but just enough to induce this DNA damage via CAD? Great question. Uh, we have thought about and looked at this a little bit. We don't know a definitive answer. I mean, there, there are multiple possibilities. So um, I, I'd say our going hypothesis is that in general, persister cells are not a distinct uh, class of cell within the population. It's simply there's you know a distribution, and these are at the edge. So of with regard to susceptibility to uh, caspase mediated death. Um, so you know th I, we imagine that each individual persister cell has found its own solution to not die, and they are just selected for. So that could be differential expression of pro or anti apoptotic uh, proteins. Um, there could be protein, yes. Yeah, so th that's one. We think in the context of drug treatment that the drug stress is quite similar on the cells because you know drug is uniformly distributed within a cell culture dish, at least. In vivo is a different story. Um, but long story short, we don't have a clear answer to that. It's basically why don't they, how do they die? How do they avoid dying yet still activate this pathway? And I think it's simply, there is a window at which cells that are almost dead but didn't quite die do nonetheless activate this signaling. That's all we can say at the moment. So, you know, uh, sort of relatedly, and I'm gonna paraphrase loosely the question that came up in Q&A, uh, which is, what do you know about the P53 status of these persister cells? Is it different from the original colony? Does it differ based on the type of inhibitor you use or the type of cancer it is in? Uh, P53 status? Yeah, so uh, it appears so prior, we have not focused on that, but prior literature would state that P53 positive and negative cells both form persister cells similarly. It doesn't seem to be a critical factor. Um, there probably are redundancies uh, that we're not aware of, um, but that's the best I can say is it's not essential. Either okay. Way. And I, I guess the other question, more generally taking a step back, the relevance of these results, um, you know, there's some of the, a lot of the cancer types you're looking at, you know, lung, melanoma, colorectal, breast, um, they are in tissues that are known to have high mutation rates and also are known to be more exposed potentially to toxins. Uh, do you think that this phenomenon is sort of tissue specific, as in there might be tissues that are not using this particular mechanism for treatment resistance, whereas some are more predisposed to do it based on the cell of origin? Yeah, I mean, well, so it's very, very possible that I, I of course, ignored the scenario in which there are pre-existing mutant cells that are just selected for during therapy, right? And I think that's a difficult to answer. That's a controversial uh, topic and very difficult to answer. In fact, the sort of deep sequencing technology we have now is not of the adequate resolution to even determine that in patient samples. How frequently is a pre-existing mutant cell simply selected for versus how frequently does resistance emerge? Do both happen simultaneously? Um, and are they both required, which is very possible as well. Um, so, and also your question about tissue specificity, we've, yeah, we've only done three tissue types so far. I can't speak about others. Um, I think it's very plausible that in other tissue types, other mutagenic mechanisms contribute. Um, one thing I will say that I'm very interested about is that in normal tissue, we actually don't know how mutations arise. There's mm -hmm. been a long term assumption that DNA replication errors are the primary source of mutagenesis, but there's been a couple of recent papers using a new technology called duplex sequencing, sequences both the plus and minus strand of DNA, and that brings the error rate down enough 
that you can take a primary set of uh, tissue where each cell has distinct mutations and sequence it simultaneously and actually identify extremely low frequency mutations that are real and dis distinguish them from PCR errors, et cetera. That data has shown that DNA, like cells that are terminally differentiated that have been terminally differentiated for decades in like warm autopsies of patients have um, many distinct mutations within them distinct from their neighbor cells. And that's evidence that during long-term quiescence, mutations arise in normal tissue. And I think it's possible that a stress mechanism could, could do that. So um, long story short, tissue specificity is on the horizon for us to address, but we haven't gotten there. <clears throat> Yeah, I, I mean, I think that's fair. And it is an incredibly complicated mechanism, like you said, with lots of component factors. Um, but to, to take another step back and look at it holistically, do you think it's dependent on the type of inhibitor you're using? So do you think that there's specific drug treatments that are going to encourage the formation of these persister cells? Or do you think it's just it, it happens irrespective of the type of drug you give? Good question. The only thing that we've done, I mean, we're certainly interested in that. We, I mean, we've done four different targeted therapies and they all do this, um, but they are, and also I'll say that targeted therapies uh, maybe are naively assumed to kill cells through canonical apoptosis, but they don't necessarily. Um, there's some examples, serafinib, for example, is a RAF inhibitor, multikinase inhibitor, partially kills through ferroptosis instead of apoptosis. So we've been interested in whether alternative death mechanisms also activate this. And in our very, very preliminary experiments, because our lab's interested in ferroptosis as well, we don't see ferroptosis activating this mechanism. So it probably is caspase driven. Mm -hmm. um, however, you know, do all targeted therapies activate this pathway to the same degree is a very important question that we don't know the answer to yet. So we have to look at that. Yeah, and, and I'm actually going to ask Dr. Gurkind if he'll come back on as well, because there are a couple of questions that I think would really benefit from both perspectives. Uh, and one really interesting one that came up in the Q&A is, what about metformin or other ETC inhibitors? Do you think that they would actually increase apoptosis in these persistent cells, or maybe BH3 mimetics? Is there some way that we could basically trigger these persistent cells to die? Matt, or yours, and I can chime in. Uh, I have tried both <laughs> previously. BH3 inhibitors are extremely effective in persister cells. MCL1 and BCLXL work quite well. There's a question about therapeutic index in patients, but they do work well in my hands, multiple persister cell models. Metformin, uh, I did a cursory test a long time ago. Uh, some efficacy, but modest, like maybe 25 to 50% decrease in persister cell survival in the concentrations that we tried. Yeah, so so we, we have used metformin in combination with them for in ketone cancer, combination with other treatment options. And, and it usually metformin in the primary if, if, if effect can have some, some impact, but what we see the best um, effect is to prevent a cancer relapse. So this was so there would be in the primary effect, um, we haven't done a lot of analysis, so there are, we contributed or um, collaborated with the group to do in response to radiation, and there is um, some increase in responses, but, but and they were also in chemo, but there is not like a compelling, seem to be more likely the, the way, where it may work metformin would be once the so-called definitive treatment is conducted to reduce or, or um, to prevent tumor relapse, seem to be more effective. Interesting. Hmm. And going along the same lines and, you know, taking a look at both of your um, uh, talks and amazing research, when we think of things like these persistent cells, do you think that those could explain some of the fact that, you know, you're seeing these high levels of mTOR, you know that mTOR inhibitors should work, and we know this in all cancer types, if you have a strong driver, you inhibit it, you don't see an effect. So sort of going back to my previous question to you, Dr. Hangor, is, is whether these these sorts of persistent cells, et cetera, happen in cancers where there's a really strong driver, like her positive breast cancer. And therefore, when you do this targeted therapy against those very strong drivers like mTOR or HER2, you end up with these persistent cell populations, whereas those cancers where we see more like a plethora of drivers and already, like you said, pre-existing mutagenic clones, this may not be as important in terms of what's contributing to resistance. Yeah, I mean, well, HER2 breast cancer, you know, BT474 cells are one of the primary models that we use. And, you know, lapatinib is extremely effective. It wipes these cells out. But there's persister cells. And the persister cells maintain um, 
HER2 signaling. That's been known, and, and that's not just for HER2, but also EGFR lung cancer. It's been shown that usually uh, signaling, I'm sorry, maintain, I'm sorry, the inhibition of signaling is maintained in the persister cells. They haven't reactivated the signaling. In fact, in the beginning of the talk, I showed the in vivo data for melanoma where phospho-ERK is down in minimal residual disease and it only comes back on during relapse. So indeed, the cells are finding a, a way to survive despite continued drug efficacy. And that's really one of the initial findings from the settlement lab as well, is that the cells aren't um, mutating around or reactivating the original signaling pathway at the persister stage. But at later resistance stages, often the uh, signaling pathway that the, the inhibitor is targeting is reactivated through one of multiple mechanisms, potentially mutagenesis. So um, Yes, the persister cells are relevant in very single oncogene driven tumors. They still survive. Yeah. So, com complementing what Matt uh, was describing, so we are part of a study that has been reviewed and is already in bioarchives, um, in which, in uh, lung cancer in this case, uh, by blocking EGFR, part of the persister cell, and primarily also the more than persister itself, as Matt was saying, that the initial step the cells become quiescent, may not be central. But maybe the growth after this period of persistence to therapy may be driven by activation of YAP. And so basically by reactivation of another pathway. So that's in 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 seem to be visible in, in other cancers as well. So the activation of YAP, the precise mechanism uh, we describe in this particular study is more through integrins in the activation of um, second, secondary to EMT, by the way. And, and, and we, we contributed to some of the aspects, but, but at the end of the day, some um, pathways may override the, the, you can call it oncogene, on, oncogene um, dependence. And and be precise. So, so at the end of the day, this is, you can call it an adaptive, adaptive uh, resistance after the initial persi um, having persistent cells. So mm -hmm. need to survive, they stay there using this process of persistence. And then uh, some of this may be able to override the growth inhibitor effect of the of the of the initial targeted therapy. And, yeah. and I'll comment just briefly on that. That I, you know, I'm very interested in that process by which a surviving persister cell, how does it enter into like a YAP-driven resistance state? What I mean is, are there stochastic epigenetic events that are happening, uh, or is it mutagenic? Or in that case, integrin signaling. Why did it not happen earlier? Why is there this delay? And I think that's an open question. It's really interesting. Yeah. Bumped, we can chat anytime. <laughs> we should. <laughs> yeah, I was actually going to say, I mean, I'm doing one-on-ones with you both later as well. But one of the things I think is really interesting and what you were showing, Dr. Angor, is that when you have those the down regulation of those DNA damage repair genes, they've shown in normal cells and bacteria that that actually triggers a cell cycle checkpoint activation response, right? So the G1 activation, like you said, might have nothing to do with S phase, nothing to do with replication, but all to do with that you're down regulating these DNA repair genes and triggering that. But fascinating, fascinating talks. Both. I'm, I'm going to stop here just because we've run out of time, sadly. There are still a couple of questions in the Q&A, but I highly encourage the people who ask those questions to reach out to Dr. Goodkind and Dr. Hangover to talk about it more. Um, sorry, we couldn't address them all this time. It was just the talks were too good, so <laughs> we, didn't, we didn't have time to get to everything. Thank you. All right, so it has been a pleasure to have you both. Uh, wonderful. Uh, in this, uh, we basically end our uh, presentation today, and we're going to move on to the round table or open discussion with the trainees. So Silvio and Matt, please stay around and we move on to um, a smaller group. Thank you, everybody.